Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A-Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I am going to share gene mutations with you. This is still part of chapter 16 which is inherited change and most of the content in this section of the chapter are really for you to understand how different codes or different changes in genetic codes might result in a mutation. So we will focus on specific mutations that are within your syllabus, but I hope that you find this really, really helpful. If you have just found this channel, you've maybe stumbled on this video in particular, I want you to know that I am posting the AS and A-level biology content in chronological order, either to help you start with revising for your exams, which I know are coming soon for some of you, or to just expose you to the content before you go to the classroom. I find that with the students I currently teach, this has been really helpful as a resource because they can watch the videos and then come to class with questions and we have a more engaging session. So I hope that you will find it that helpful and it will help you as you start to learn biology for your A-level syllabus. So let's get into gene mutations. So usually the first question I get with students is, well, I mean, what happened? How did gene mutations come about? I mean, what exactly happened? Those are some of the things we will explore in chapter 17. But I want to start off with letting you know that gene mutations have always been part of our existence for the longest time. Think about the fact that you might have white rabbits and brown rabbits, right? The color brown might be the normal color of a rabbit and the white color might be a mutation that caused the rabbit to not produce a brown fur. In other words, gene mutations have become so normalized in our society that you might find that there are so many mutations that have arisen from different populations, but that does not necessarily affect the existence of that population. In many instances, gene mutations are a bit more dire than that. They can be very severe in their consequences. But before we go into all of that, let's first of all think about what a mutation is. So a gene mutation, as you can see here on the third bullet point, is a change in the structure of a DNA molecule resulting in the production of a different allele, which means, for example, if within a particular population, everyone is dark skinned um, and maybe they produce a lot of melanin. So that is the general rule of this population genetically. There might be a mutation in the genes and mutations are caused by a variety of things, which you can see here on the slide. And those mutations can cause a different allele to be produced that might then result in some members of the same population producing a different skin color other than dark skin. And this is how mutations simply, um, simply express themselves in society. Mutations can occur very randomly, and this is something I say to my biology students in the classroom as well, that mutations can be very random because usually when we have DNA replication, there are sometimes a lot of errors in that DNA replication process. Some of those errors are non-consequential, which means that they don't result in any significant change. You might already have learned, if you've learned the triplet codes, well, not learned them in terms of memorizing them, but if you've looked at the triplet code table, you might remember that some amino acids are coded for by more than one triplet code. For example, you might find that a triplet code UAA um, codes for maybe alanine and UAC also codes for alanine. What this means is that during DNA replication, if for some reason this A is replaced by a C, you would still get the exact same amino acid. So these errors occur quite frequently. But most of the time, you would also find that gene mutations are caused by environmental factors like ionizing radiation, UV radiation, um, smoking um, is also a source of gene mutations, as you might have learned from the gas exchange and smoking chapter. Exposure to a compound called benzene is also known to be a mutagen. Uh, benzene is a petrochemical compound and it is very common in petroleum especially, and you would find that it is one of the most important pollutants in the world and it is known to cause cancer. Formaldehyde, asbestos, and in some cases, processed meat and mustard gas have also been identified as factors that cause mutations. And in this case, because they cause mutations, they are called carcinogens. And they are called mutagens, sorry. Carcinogens are compounds that cause cancer. In this case, they are mutagens. So let's think about it. How, does mut how do mutations occur? There are three ways in which a mutation can happen. You can have what we call a base substitution. 
A base substitution means that one nucleotide base, which could be adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine, is replaced by another base. So in this case, you can have GAG becoming GTG. Now, like I said on the previous slide, that is not always a dire situation. It's not always a terrible thing because you would find that many of the amino acids that make up the genes have more than one triplet code and those mutations still code for the same amino acid. So it is the least severe form of a mutation. You can also have base addition. And a base addition is when you have one or more extra bases added to a gene sequence and therefore they disrupt how that gene sequence is read. And sometimes these can be very, very um, problematic because you would find that when you have additions to a base, especially if these are random additions, they change the amino acid sequence completely. A base deletion is when a base is lost from the sequence. And as you might be able to see here um, on this um, image I've put over here, that you have a base deletion of CTC somewhere on this um, and this um, template. So this CTC here has been deleted, and as a result of that, it has shortened the gene. And by shortening the gene, there is a chance that the protein might not, the protein that would be produced might not be as functional as it as it should be. In this case, in the case of this paper that has been reported by Bilal Hussein, um, it's still a functional protein, but in many cases you might find that that is not the case. Of all of these three possibilities, base substitutions, like I said, are the ones that are likely to not have any effects and are often referred to as silent mutations. Now let's look at some examples of the expressions of mutations. You've probably heard of sickle cell anemia. If you live in some parts of Africa, you will know that this is a condition that is endemic um, to many of such regions, especially if you're from West Africa. Um, also, if you're from India, you would also find that sickle cell anemia is quite common. Sickle cell anemia is a genetic condition and the result, the reason it happens is because there is a base substitution mutation. The normal allele has this amino acid sequence over here. So valine, histamine, leucine, threonine, proline, glutamine, glutamine, and lysine. Not that you have to know any of that because I believe you would be told if you had to know that for the exam, but it's just the habit I have to read out the amino acids when I see them. Now, whenever you have a base substitution in this gene um, that codes for the shape of the red blood cells, you would find that the glutamine, um, the very first glutamine, which is this one over here, is changed to valine. Now, the problem with this is that valine is a hydrophobic amino acid, which means it doesn't like water. So what it does in this case is that it changes the shape of the red blood cells. So the red blood cells typically are convex disc shaped cells um, and you can see they look round and they're able to transport oxygen um, significantly in that shape. However, when glutamine is changed to valine in this um, in this mutation, the red blood cells change their shape as well, which means because valine is a hydrophobic amino acid, it basically causes this curving away from the water solution or the blood solution in the body. Um, it changes the beta, uh, beta globin to become less soluble. So it changes the beta globin in hemoglobin that is part of the red blood cells and that becomes less soluble. Um, and these kinds of cells tend to stick to each other because think about it, they, they sort of have like binding sites now if you want to think about it that way. They form long fibers instead, um, instead of being this long um, round shaped cells rather. And they have a sickle shape, which is why this is called um, sickle cell anemia. And as a result of this, they can get stuck in the capillaries and they are unable to transport oxygen as well as they should. So sickle cell anemia is very important and usually my students at the end of their second year do presentations on um, sickle cell anemia as a condition and one of the presentations was how do you increase people's chances of getting a second date and the reason for this is because in places where sickle cell anemia is endemic people would often put the um, sickle cell genotype they would often ask about genotype before they decide if or whether or not they would want to go on a second date so I just thought that would be important to mention that that this is a genetic mutation that even affects how we relate in society. 
Now, if you look at this graph over here, you will see the distribution of sickle cell anemia around the world. And as you can see over here, in places in West Africa, there's quite a lot of um, sickle cell anemia as well as in central parts of Africa as well. So sickle cell anemia is a quite common condition um, that you'd find in a number of developing regions across the world um, and tends to be absent from regions like Europe and the Americas as well. The next one I want to touch on is albinism. Albinism is a homozygous recessive trait. So when I say it is homozygous recessive, what that means is that for a person to become an albino or to, ex to present as an albino rather, they would need to have two of the albinism alleles. And when they have two of these alleles, then they express the albino trait. So think about it this way. A person can have a normal allele, let's say the normal allele is um, capital A, and they might also carry the albinism allele, which we now know is recessive, and that would be small a. And if they were to mate with a person who also has the same genotype as they do, they have a chance of producing an offspring that would be an albino, right? Albinism is simply the missing or the absence of melanin, either in the skin, um, sometimes it occurs only in the eyes, as I'll show you on a different slide, but it's the absence of melanin from the skin, from the eyes, from the hair as well. And you would find that people who have help, um, albinism tend to have pale blue eyes or pink eyes or the pupils also appear red. The skin is also really pale. And just like I said earlier, there's one that typically affects um, just the eyes and it is called ocular albinism and it is sex linked. But in this case, I just wanted to point out to you that it is important for you to know that albinism is homozygous recessive. And so this person would express albinism. However, these two here would not express albinism because they have this big A, which is a dominant allele and sort of expresses the production of melanin. And so that is um, albinism. You also find it, it's very common in the Hopi population in Arizona um, and in some of the Indian populations as well. So like I said on the previous slide, you also have what you call ocular albinism. And if you look at this chart here, this is typically what ocular albinism looks like. It is the lack of production of melanin in the eyes, even though other aspects of the body produce enough melanin. And this is a sex-linked trait, which means that it is carried either by the X chromosome or by the Y chromosome. Always remember that whenever you are asked to denote a sex-linked trait, you have to check if it's carried by the X or Y chromosome. Let's assume that ocular albinism is carried by the X chromosome. In this case, if a person is homozygous recessive for ocular albinism, that would be denoted as such. Okay, And if a person expresses normal, but they are a carrier, so carrier means that they have it as a recessive trait, but they're also carrying a normal allele for that same trait, then this would be how it would be expressed. And sex-linked genes typically determine which child would get, um, what gender or sex of child rather, would get a particular condition. So for example, if it's a Y-linked trait, so let's assume that this was a Y-linked trait over here, then in this case, if they have a male child, that male child will definitely get ocular albinism because it is carried on the Y chromosome and the child, a male child only gets the Y chromosome from his parent, um, from his father rather. And so that is how ocular albinism works. It is also just to here to highlight what the pathway is that results in this mutation, is that um, melanin is not produced. And the reason melanin is not produced is because there is a lack of an enzyme called tyrosinase. So an error in the genetic code is hindering the production of tyrosinase, which means there is either no production of tyrosinase or in the case where tyrosinase is produced, it is produced in an inactive form simply because there's been a mutation. And so what that then does is that it prevents the pathway for the formation of melanin. Melanin is typically produced by the formation, uh, by the conversion rather, of tyrosine to a, com a compound called DOPA. DOPA is then converted to dopaquinone and dopaquinone is converted to melanin. Tyrosinase facilitates the conversion of tyrosine to DOPA. Now, when tyrosinase is inactive, then that means that DOPA cannot be formed. And if DOPA is not formed, dopaquinone cannot be formed, which then means melanin cannot be formed. And so as a result of that, you then have ocular albinism. Um, in some cases, you might have albinism all across the body.
There's another condition called Huntington's disease. Huntington's disease is a very severe condition and most of the people who have it have 50% chance of passing it on to their children. It is a condition where the mutation is a dominant allele, in which case when people have Huntington's, even if they have another allele that is different from it, they will express Huntington's. It is a neurodegenerative disease. It causes involuntary movements. It causes mental deterioration, speech difficulty, muscle contraction problems, brain cells are lost at an alarming rate, and the ventricles, so those are um, the ventricles on the brain, they typically become larger. And the reason why Huntington's is so problematic and so scary is that it tends to start showing itself in the middle age when people might have had children. Um, in other words, many people don't even know that they have Huntington's until they get to a certain age. So perhaps in their um, late 30s or early 40s or mid 40s, are that that's when the condition starts to show up and as a result of that people are most likely would have passed it on to children it is caused by an unstable segment in a gene on chromosome 4 and what that gene codes for is a protein called huntington um, i usually make fun of this so in class we say huntington's and huntington just so we can be able to tell the difference between the two now, in normal people, the protein is coded for by a small number of repeats um, of CAG, but in people with the disease, there are lots more CAGs than necessary, and that is often called a stutter. So a stutter in a gene simply means that you have a lot of repetitions that you typically don't need, and as a result of that, it might result in some nerve condition or expression of a disease that is typically undesirable for the individual. The last one is hemophilia, and um, over here I've put a picture of the last disease of Russia because this again is another way I try to show the students how these conditions relate to society. Uh, because typically, when we learn biology, we tend to think these things only happen outside of, um, you know, they only happen within the lab or the things that we discuss in isolation from society. But biology does have a great impact on society. So, in case you don't know the story of the last disease of Russia, it is said that. Um, the Tsar and his wife had a son and the son had hemophilia and as a result of that he was um, very vulnerable to dying because people who have hemophilia are unable to make a blood clot when they have an injury and as a result of that they might bleed out um, and even have bleeding in the brain so they are very susceptible to death. And so um, because of that, the Tsar and his wife started to consult with a spiritualist, which then led to some kind of revolution because people believed that the spiritualist was leading the country rather than the Tsar himself. So that is just one of the ways in which hemophilia has impacted history um, and also impacted society. So people who have hemophilia, um, is they usually have just the possibility of bleeding between their joints and they're very susceptible to bruising as well. And hemophilia is a sex-linked recessive disease, which means in this case, um, it's also X-linked, so it's on the X chromosome. But when we say sex-linked recessive, it means that an individual, for example, a woman might have hemophilia, but not express it because it is a recessive condition. So if she has one normal allele, then she would not express hemophilia. But if this woman were to, for some reason, meet a man who also had hemophilia on his X chromosome, then there was a very great chance of her making a daughter because these two X's might combine with each other. She might make a daughter who then expresses hemophilia. She might also make a daughter who also remains a carrier of hemophilia. Um, in this case, um, so she might make a daughter who then has the same um, alleles as she does. And what I've done here is I have left a couple of questions here to say if a father has hemophilia, what are the chances of passing it to his son or his daughter? If a mother has hemophilia on one of her X chromosomes, what are the chances of passing it on to her son or her daughter? And I just want you to work on that a little bit. I think I've sort of solved one of them for you here. But try to solve it um, yourself because these are some of the questions or the types of questions that would typically come up in CIE. I'm going to stop here now. Um, this is one section of the chapter done. And in the next section, I will teach you gene control um, and teach you how the LAC operand works. And so um, just look out for the next video and watch it as soon as it is ready. I wish you good luck for those of you preparing for your exams. All the best.